Hi everyone, thank you for joining the School-Based Health Alliance for today's webinar, Preparing for a Return to the Classroom, Suicide Prevention in Schools. This webinar will address three key evidence-based topics and the resources to support school staff as they manage current or emerging suicidal thoughts and behaviors in their students during the COVID-19 crisis. Presenters will share the rationale and tools to develop an individual and meaningful safety plan via telehealth, equip teachers and school staff with the skills to identify and respond to youth who may be at risk, and provide a thoughtful approach for supporting the school and family should a suicide occur. This webinar is co-hosted with the Suicide Prevention Resource Center, SPRC, the nation's federally funded resource center devoted to implementation of the National Strategy for Suicide Prevention. SPRC is a project of the Education Development Center. Before we begin, if you are viewing as a group, please go to the chat window in the chat icon and type in the name of the person registered and the total number of additional people in the room. For example, Tammy Jones plus three. This will help us with our final attendance count. The School-Based Health Alliance works to improve the health of children and youth by advancing and advocating for school-based health care. We believe that all children and adolescents deserve to thrive, but too many struggle because they lack access to healthcare services. School-based healthcare is the solution, bringing healthcare to where students already spend the majority of their time, in school. When health and education come together, great things happen. Attendance improves, conditions like asthma or diabetes are better managed, and behavioral health issues get quick expert attention. And we all know that healthy students make better learners. Now, we have a few housekeeping reminders. All attendees are in listen-only mode. However, we want to hear your questions. To ask a question at any point during the webinar, please use the chat tool located in your Zoom control bar. When asking a question with the chat function, please make sure you are addressing both panelists and attendees. We will address questions following the presentation. At the end of this webinar, attendees will be asked to complete evaluation poll questions. Please let us know how we are doing. Your feedback is vital in helping us craft presentations that meet your needs. Also, we have an ASL interpreter for this webinar. To keep their video on your screen throughout the entire presentation, click on the three blue dots next to their name and click pin video. This webinar is being recorded and will be archived on our website in one to three business days. Please also visit the School-Based Health Alliance website for additional archived webinars for topics such as the ones you are viewing on your screen. Now I would like to introduce our presenters for today. Julie Goldstein Grummet is the director of the Zero Suicide Institute and the director of the Healthcare Initiative at the Suicide Prevention Resource Center. Jen Myers is the training development manager for the trauma and violence team at the Education Development Center. Ann Duckless is the community educator at NAMI, New Hampshire. Now I will hand it over to Julie to get us started. so much. Let me get my screen up. We're good. You see my screen? We can see your screen. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for that introduction. And it's really a pleasure to be here, as well as to see, I can even see where a few of you are calling in from and just really exciting to be able to join you today. Uh, we'll be talking about what to do when school begins this fall, really obviously unprecedented time, and how to identify and care for the kids who may be at risk for suicide. The interventions and the actions that we share today are all effective evidence-based prevention practices. So these weren't anything new for COVID and quarantine, but we will share some ways they can be adapted for use virtually. Uh, I'm the director of the health on behavioral health care initiatives team at the Suicide Prevention Resource Center funded by the Substance Abuse Mental Health Services Administration and the views, opinions, and content in today's webinar do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of SAMHSA. I'm also the director of the Zero Suicide Institute at EDC. To learn more about Zero Suicide, you can visit zerosuicide.com. It is a comprehensive approach to how healthcare systems in particular should be addressing suicide prevention using best practices that we know work and healthcare systems who have used this approach have seen reductions in rates of suicide by as much as 65 to 75% among patients in their care. It's a 
it is an initiative I think that could be modified, particularly with school-based health clinics. Um, so I hope you'll learn more about zero suicide uh, after today's webinar. Today's presentation is intended to help school communities to think about how to address suicide prevention in school, whether it's in person or remotely. Some of the traditional ways of intervening or even policies and practices your school system had adopted prior, prior to COVID may not be as easy to use or as accessible while we're in quarantine. And some of them you wanna to continue to use, but you have to think about how are you gonna tweak uh, uh, remotely. Given the complexities of returning to school, whether it is in person or virtual, and we know that this pandemic is placing an added burden on school staff, families, uh, students. We also know that beyond just the pandemic itself, this idea of doing remote learning and the technology is a considerable stressor on staff, students, and their families. Isolation, uncertainty, financial insecurity, family discord, things, all the challenges that you're all aware of and aren't new to you are impacting all of us in ways that may increase students' risk for mental health problems, which could include thoughts of suicide. Preparedness is key. Right, we talk a lot about suicide prevention, but also primarily about suicide preparedness. Uh, having a comprehensive approach, having plans in place, having training so that you know what to do. Identifying kids at risk is critical and still possible now more than ever. Suicide prevention requires a comprehensive approach. There is no single intervention or activity or a one-time event that will reduce suicide in a community or in a school. So the interventions and the resources that we're discussing today are intended to be part of an overall comprehensive system-wide approach. We've already talking about, uh, done some discussions about the learning objectives, so I will move on. I'm with the SPRC. This is the nation's resource center, uh, just dedicated to advancing the national strategy for suicide prevention. So we, you can find information about SPRC at sprc.org. We provide the information, resources, and tools for a variety of settings and professional roles. All of our products or trainings are based on the best available evidence and attend to a variety of settings, schools, college, university, workplace, primary care, all types of behavioral health systems, correctional, faith. It really does take this whole constellation of settings, providers, members of the community to reduce suicide. And we have to do that in a sustained and meaningful way. None of these activities can be one and done and not any one single of these settings can be uh, the one focused area for suicide prevention. So a little bit about suicide in youth. Suicide is the second leading cause of death for people ages 10 to 34. When you think about that and you look at some of the other uh, health-related issues, why people are dying. It's certainly, um, you know, pretty upsetting to see it as a second leading cause of death, given that we certainly believe there are a lot of things we can do to reduce and prevent suicide. Girls think about suicide, plan for their suicide, and attempt suicide more than boys do. And while boys still have higher rates of suicide, rates for girls have been increasing more so than for boys in the last several years. The trends are pretty similar for middle school students, though the overall percentages of suicides are lower. So I wanna talk a little bit uh, about safety planning, which is an effective intervention. We've already done several webinars on safety planning, which go into much greater detail about how to create a meaningful safety plan. And we're gonna share those links in the chat um, throughout the webinar so you can access them later. Safety planning is considered an intervention, not just a tool. It should be conducted on the same day you determine that someone is at risk for suicide as it provides the youth with the skills to manage their distress and build coping strategies. The safety plan should be reviewed at every visit with someone who is screened positive for suicide risk. The purpose of the safety planning intervention is to provide people who are experiencing suicidal ideation with a specific set of concrete strategies to use in order to decrease the risk of suicidal behaviors. A safety plan includes coping strategies that can be used, as well as the individuals and agencies to be contacted, and ideally the youth learns their own triggers and, cope and develops coping skills. 
And this is really important. We want to use the least restrictive environment of care for people. Essentially, we want to keep people out of the hospital. Uh, people only go to the hospital for three days, five days a week, and then they're right back in our care. So ultimately, we really want to equip clinicians with um, the, the skills and the tools to keep people safe and to provide them with hope and, and move towards recovery. So especially when doing treatment virtually, it's critical to start the session by gathering the person's current location in case you need to initiate emergency services. And you wanna do this at every visit. You need to discuss what you're gonna do if there's tech issues. What if you know, the Wi-Fi goes down or Zoom you can't log on? So who's gonna call whom back? What's the phone number? Do this at the start of every session. You also want to review privacy issues at the start of every session. Does the, does the youth feel that they can minimize disruptions? Are they talking in a private setting? Do they need to stick a towel under the door to make sure that others in their home can't hear them? Uh, and you need to develop a plan for how you can stay on the phone with the youth if there's an emergency. Are there two lines in your house or is there some other way uh, to be able to reach out to emergency services? You also really want to think about uh, engaging the student with understanding how to use the platform, how to talk to you in Zoom, uh, in the chat feature of Zoom. Maybe there are things they want to tell you, but there are people kind of nearby and they don't want to say them. So kind of orienting a person to using the platform if you're working with them remotely and all different kind of modes of, of having this conversation will be really important. And you also need to let youth know how you're going to bring their parents or guardians into the conversation. So you do that at the start of every session. You also want to screen kids at the start of every session. People's life circumstances changed. This is the Columbia Suicide Severity Rating Scale called the CSSRS. It's a widely used tool to screen people for risk of suicide. Others use what's called the Patient Health Questionnaire 9, PHQ-9. If youth uh, respond affirmatively, so they're saying things that are in the red or orange range, then you have to do an, an, an additional assessment immediately following the screener. This is another tool called the ASQ. There's information about the ASQ and the Columbia screener on the zerosuicide.com website. So I mentioned you have to do a risk assessment. This is the Columbia risk assessment version. Uh, you'd want to be able to do this at every visit. I think what's really important is that, as I said, clinicians screen youth for their thoughts of suicide at every visit and that you're using a thorough risk assessment standardized tool. So not trying to do something from memory, that you're really using something both so that you can track somebody's progress over time and that you haven't missed anything. Studies show when people use standardized tools that uh, actually their assessments are stronger than just clinical judgment. It really is a combination, but it's, it's really important to use standardized tools. Okay. So if a youth screens positive for suicide, then you want to develop a safety plan with them. A safety planning intervention is a collaborative effort between a treatment provider and the patient. It really takes about 30 minutes to complete. The basic steps of a safety plan include recognizing the warning signs of an impending suicidal crisis, using coping strategies, contacting others in order to distract them, uh, the individual from their suicidal thoughts, contacting family members or friends who can help to resolve the crisis, then contacting the mental health professional or agency if those other preceding steps really weren't helpful, as well as including reducing their access to the availability of means to complete the suicide. So you can see it's a stepwise plan, increasing uh, kind of ascendancy of like more, more and more steps, but the initial steps are really self-driven, really empowering the individual to kind of learn how to manage their distress on their own. Some of the things that may have been sources of support or comfort to a youth when we weren't socially distanced might be a little bit more difficult right now. So you need to kind of review this at every visit and make sure that the things that are listed in their safety plan work. Um, a couple of things about safety plans. They have to be unique to an individual. So if you were to look through all of your safety plans, it shouldn't say every one of them shouldn't include going for a run, doing yoga, writing in a journal, right? It has to be unique and meaningful to the individual. Do they like to watch cat videos on YouTube? Do they like to create comic books or talk to a friend, go for a walk in the park? What are the things that are really helpful to them? And this is why it can take 
longer than you might expect to complete. It's collaboratively developed, um, and it's a tool for each individual's uh, personal distress. Another thing about safety planning is it is not the same thing as a safety contract. There's nothing here requiring a youth to sign it or a pledge that they promise not to kill themselves. It is about managing their distress. And a safety contract doesn't give anybody the tools for what to do when they feel that way. It's, the safety contract is absolutely something that you should not be using. It is ineffective. There's no research to suggest that it uh, helps a suicidal person. Um, and it is something that we would strongly discourage you from ever using. Um, finally, you really want to think about how can you ensure that the youth has a copy of their safety plan um, after the session. Do they take a picture of it or is there a way that you can email it to them? There are apps and it's uh, coming up in a slide I have on some resources later on uh, so that they can put their safety plan there. You really want to make sure this is something they can easily access. Uh, you know, doing safety plans virtually really isn't that dissimilar from doing one in person. So you may want to just think about are there resources that are as accessible to the person while they're quarantined. You certainly want to educate the person about the purpose of their safety plan. You want to practice the skills that are included in their safety plan to ensure that what they have listed are things that are viable and meaningful um, that, and things that they would actually use during a crisis. Um, and safety plans can and should be developed by school-based mental health staff, whether they're in person or remote. The last bullet here really just kind of speaks to the thought that we really do want to keep people out of hospitals. This is true certainly during, you know, the tightened time of COVID, but even without COVID, ideally people should be learning to manage their distress with clinicians that are using evidence-based practices, feel comfortable and confident caring for somebody at risk for suicide. There are times I, I can see something popping up that's saying managing at home is not always safer, and that is true. I am not trying to suggest nobody ever needs to be hospitalized, but we do historically sometimes over-rely on emergency departments and hospitals. Um, and so using the, some of the tools that we just kind of walked through, screening, assessment, safety planning, uh, there are really great tools for evidence-based treatment, cognitive therapy for suicide prevention, dialectical behavior therapy, CAMS. If when used, we do know that the research says people can spend less time in the hospital when they're getting care that kind of attends to their suicidal thoughts and behaviors very directly. There's a lot more information on zerosuicide.com about that, but I, I just sort of want to put that out there. These are the websites uh, that I was mentioning that have a lot of resources on COVID and suicide prevention. And I want to thank you for uh, sharing your day with all of us. And I'm going to, these are the resources I was mentioning. Uh, you'll have this slide deck. I know it's recorded and you'll have access to the deck afterwards. And I'm going to turn it over to Jen. Great. Thanks, Julie. Um, very helpful information. Um, I'm going to switch my slides here. I know there are some questions about links and things like that. You'll definitely have an opportunity to explore the safety plan resources and links following this webinar with the resources that will be available to you. So I wanted to comment um, that I will be going into the full school perspective. Um, what Julie went through is absolutely important for anyone who's at risk for suicide. I will be talking across the spectrum uh, from a school perspective for those who might be struggling, might be at risk, but also universally. And I always like to start first with Let's take care of ourselves first. I know we're not flying right now, but a reminder that we always put on our oxygen mask first. And I heard from a colleague earlier today who just said, you know, even though I have extra time off right now, it always feels so busy during the pandemic. And I know many of our school staff and professionals and parents and things like that are feeling that right now. And so I encourage you in this putting your mask on first is to go beyond what might feel like traditional self-care or even community care strategies past what Julie mentioned with yoga and journaling into maybe there are places I need to say no or step away from the news or take a break more, ask for some time alone as we all are ha hanging out at home more and um, with families and things like that. And so what are the things that you need to do to care for your own mental health 
um, so that you're able to then care for others as you're looking at school reopening. So I wanted to mention, I talked about the approach that we're taking. Many of you know about social emotional learning and mental health approaches across a multi-tiered system of support. And you think of this tier one really being universal, tier two targeted, and tier three intensive. And I will be talking across all of those tiers uh, just to comment. I do want to bring in um, to remember that all of this is surrounded not just by universal design for learning, but equitable access and really thinking across the equity needs from a diverse lens of what you might need in your schools. So what I'd like to talk about is really building a universal suicide prevention foundation. And so how do we do that in our school? Um, Julie was talking about what we might do as a safety plan to help those at risk. Universally, we need to increase protective factors, decrease risk factors, look for warning signs, make sure that we're providing those additional tier two and tier three supports for those that might be at higher risk, but also have a plan to respond, support, and follow up, and keep supporting and follow up. So that's what the foundation of what I'll be talking more about. So when I say protective factors, how do we make safer homes? And in this situation, this link that you'll get from the webinar here is, is to how to suicide proof or say make your home safer from a suicide perspective. So may not be exactly what some of you might think of from a domestic violence or abuse or neglect or adverse childhood experiences standpoint, but more to lock medications and firearms and things like that because what we know about those uh, who are at risk for suicide or attempt suicide, is they often do so um, in a short period of time. You don't have a lot of response time, so having a safer home uh, helps. So increasing protective factors means we really work to have students who are connected and feel like they belong. It can be hard to be the only or a handful uh, from a certain racial, ethnic, gender identity, sexual orientation, spiritual belief system, abilities, you know, those types of things. Um, so how do we help people truly feel connected and belong? They get effective mental health care. You heard uh, what Julie described is an effective evidence-based treatments and screenings and uh, tools, uh, making sure that we're providing that in school. Having your um, problem-solving skills, conflict resolution skills, and teaching those on how to handle disputes. And also, increasing help seeking and hope, but also what else can we do? You don't need to teach cultural or spiritual beliefs that discourage suicide necessarily, but supporting those who have them uh, in your schools may be helpful. How do we reduce risk factors? So we respond to and protect from abuse and neglect and maltreatment. We screen for and identify for adverse childhood experiences. We know about previous suicide attempts and we provide the appropriate tier level of supports and treatments, even if it's been two, three, or 10 years ago, because we know that someone who's attempted suicide before or has a family history of suicide death is at greater risk of attempting or dying by suicide. So we also think about how do we identify and teach and respond to those who are showing impulsive or aggressive tendencies, who are more isolated, and thinking not just that we're home or socially distanced, but also dis those who might feel isolated from a um, social media standpoint, um, aren't connecting through technology like many of our youth are. Uh, may have increased access to lethal methods, which means that's that safer homes. It reduces that risk factor. And that we're responding to and identifying any substance misuse or any previous mental health disorder, even if the person is doing better now, we can continue to provide those supports in our schools to help support them. So what are these life circumstances that we might look for to provide extra support for those at higher risk? And in here, it mentions bullying, but we also need to think about discrimination or um, any racism or sexism or other things that someone might be experiencing in their communities or their schools. Uh, relationship breakups. I know when I was doing counseling a lot with younger people, I was often thinking about like, oh, it gets better. I used to think in my head like, oh, it gets better when you're, you know, past 14, 15, 16, like trust me, it works a lot better when you're an adult. And sometimes I'd have to remind myself that this person 
even if it was a three-week relationship, at 15 years old, they are communicating to me that they are in a crisis, and it actually is one of the most um, significant um, precipitating factors, things that might activate or trigger a suicidal crisis, um, and so important to pay attention to. Those who might be struggling uh, with chronic illnesses or even within their family or additional legal problems. And then, you know, we need to make sure that we're supporting those who have complex or challenging home lives. There may be some who are home more often and um, there's more substance use around, or maybe there's more violence around, or there's less access to um, even grocery stores, and those things may have just challenging environments. Um, there may be high, maybe they had a higher adverse childhood experiences score or you know experiences prior to the pandemic, and there there may be um, potentially more activated from a trauma perspective. Anyone who's experienced recent loss or a complicated grief, what's occurring right now might be um, activating some additional mental health or grief concerns for them, which could uh, contribute to suicide risk. So when I say look for warning signs, what do we look for? And we need to teach everyone in our schools universally, tier one, to look for these. Um, talking about writing about suicide, including on social media. This includes sharing songs, which might be uh, say, easy to dismiss in youth sometimes of, oh, it was just a song lyric. If it's a suicidal reference, it may be someone thinking about or talking about suicide, and it needs to be looked for and followed up on. Thinking about no reasons to live, being a burden to others, and especially if you think about students who uh, you're working with, youth that you're working with, who um, may be in have a community or a family belief system where the we is greater than the I. So in American culture, often the I is greater than the we. We put individualized uh, first. There may be um, ethnicities, cultures, spiritual beliefs where the family really comes first or the group comes first. And if you feel like you've shamed your family in some way, even as a child, you're not performing well enough or whatever it might be, you might feel as if you're a burden. I can't ask for help and therefore may be a greater risk uh, to die by suicide. What other warning signs do we look for? Hopelessness, rage, feeling trapped like there's no way out. And often for those of us who are helpers, we can look at this and say, um, well, of course there's a way out for you. Um, but that person doesn't see it or feel it. Um, so it's important to remember that even if you can see it, um, it, it is a warning sign. Sleeping too little or too much. Displaying extreme mood swings, and I know those of you who have teenagers or preteens might say, well, that's every, every youth. Know within context and know within um, uh, what, what other warning signs am I looking for, right? Um, being withdrawn or isolated or sometimes pushed out of the group. Maybe I got hurt and I can't play that sport anymore or we're not playing that sport and we're not together during this coronavirus crisis and so I feel isolated even if I had a group before. Um, so, um, prepare, so it's important to be prepared uh, for all of the types of school options we might be looking into and, and heading into. So this hybrid or blended, maybe a couple days in school for your A group and your B groups coming another day. Think about all virtual and also all in person. How do I identify those warning signs and what do I do as a teacher or a coach or um, someone who's delivering meals or handing them to students if I see these signs and having a plan for that. Um, and important to train ahead of time. I see a question actually about training, um, how to do so, so that when we see these signs, we're asking directly about suicide risk. And the cool thing is that resource Julie shared, the Columbia Suicide Severity Rating Scale, can be asked by anyone uh, as long as there's an existing relationship um, or someone identifies those signs. They can ask those questions. They're not just limited to a healthcare professional. Um, for the screening tool. So when we say support all students, really apply those trauma-informed principles, which means you might screen for things like the adverse childhood experiences, but also consider safety, transparency. What's peer support look like for a 12-year-old? What does um, concern for respect for the cultural or historical um, and family 
um, concerns they might be bringing. Teaching these flexible problem solving and conflict resolution skills, which can be integrated into your social emotional learning curriculum and into your day to day kind of classroom uh, teaching. And then connecting in the student style and language. I saw someone earlier ask about um, the uh, virtual connections. Important to continue those right now. And there have been some adjustments to HIPAA given coronavirus uh, space right now. A lot of this is what Julie went through, so I won't spend a lot of time on this. Just know that you might need to double check who needs the tier two and tier three supports. And it's important to teach your whole school staff, anyone really in a relationship with students, um, very basic techniques like distress tolerance techniques or mindfulness that they can integrate into their social emotional learning or their day-to-day -day, uh, teaching that might assist in building these even for those um, who have tier two and tier three without necessarily being therapy. Expand the safety net doesn't have to be just on educators and the mental health and healthcare professionals and administrators supporting schools. And teach parents, families, coaches, all of your staff in the schools, all of the things we just talked about. What do we need to build? What do we need to look for? And how do we respond if we notice them? Um, and what should they do? Who do they go to? Especially in virtual learning spaces. If I see suicide risk, where is my go-to and how do I get them quickly because I can't just walk down the hall to the counselor or front office. There are lots of apps that you can use. My3 is a great safety planning app that I think Julie may have mentioned also and a virtual hope box too. All of these, I'm not going to, you don't have to click on these, they'll all be a part of the follow-up here. So I know that may have gone through fairly fast. Some people have asked some questions. So I'm going to stop sharing here, hand off to Anne uh, with NAMI New Hampshire to go into postvention, and we'll get a chance to address some questions in the chat or towards the end today. Thank you very much, uh, both Julie and um, both Julie and um, oh, gracious. I got to go back here. Uh, both Julie and Jen, thank you for that. Um, okay, so um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, you know, with baseball now having started up, um, it's kind of like I'm the cleanup hitter today um, for the third panelist. I'm from the National Alliance on Mental Illness in New Hampshire with the Connect program. And unlike my two earlier panelists, um, postvention is all about an effective response after an individual has been lost to suicide or any other sudden de death such as a drug overdose death. Um, so that death has already happened. And now we want to prevent future incidents from happening moving forward. So that's what I'm talking about uh, today. This is um, the self-care slide that I think is very key. I'm glad Julie mentioned it, uh, because certainly when we're talking about postvention, which is all about death and dying from a sudden loss, um, we need to keep in mind self-care. Um, I am sure that uh, many attendees in um, today's webinar uh, may have lost somebody to suicide or any other sudden death, um, either personally or professionally. And I want to assure you that you are not alone in this loss. Um, that um, www.theconnectprogram.org website is a plethora of loss survivor resources and supports um, and also more localized support groups here in New Hampshire. Um, I have also um, shared five handouts regarding postvention, uh, do this, not that, reminders for postvention in time of coronavirus, strategies and tips for effective postvention response in a virtual world, experiencing loss and isolation, and tips for talking to youth after traumatic events for parents and educators. So please check out uh, those five resources regarding postvention. So what is postvention? It is a planned proactive response. Um, and that response is unrolled or unveiled after a sudden death to include suicide in order to promote healing and reduce risk moving forward. 
So that proactive planning means having those, um, those protocols, those postvention protocols in place before the sudden death happens, whether it is a drug overdose death, um, an, an alcohol-related uh, incident, a car crash, or a suicide death. The research is unequivocally that any of us who has known somebody who has died by suicide, it definitely increases our own risk for suicide. And we need to keep that in mind because that risk is especially um, critical for youth and young adults. Um, their brains aren't fully developed until the mid-20s with the frontal lobe, uh, the prefrontal cortex being the um, rational cognitive part of the brain, uh, limited coping skills, and less life experiences. So uh, we want to really be mindful of what that research tells us. And that risk of contagion exists for all of us on the call today and, and elsewhere across the country that are youth serving organizations to include schools and college campuses. It's just um, a risk that we need to keep in mind moving forward um, in terms of promoting healing, especially um, with this um, segment of the population. And um, suicide, mental health, and stigma. We know that 90% of people who do um, take their lives may have an underlying mental health or substance use issue, but by no means is it a cause and effect. We know there is no one cause and effect for a suicide death. It is uh, so many of those risk factors that Jen was sharing um, in her last presentation. Um, and so we know also that anybody having um, suicide risk or mental health or substance use problems, they may have secrecy, isolation, guilt, shame, blame, lack of support from others. All of these are such negative, stigmatizing, uh, judgmental, um, phenomena, frankly, around suicide. And it's interesting because other public health issues and medical conditions such as cancer or diabetes do not have these same kind of negative uh, words and associations. So that's why we need, um, in all levels of our society, we need to talk about suicide as a public health issue. And speaking about the death in public, we're always having to balance the respect for the family's right to privacy, uh, but also responding to this issue as a public health issue, because that's really ultimately how we can save lives. If we're putting out those warning signs, if we're putting out what people should look for in order to seek help for them or their loved ones. But when the family is able to be open that this has been a drug overdose death or a suicide death, it allows all of us in the larger uh, community or schools or youth serving agencies to offer up those local and national resources uh, so that people can get connected to help in the community and to reduce risk. And it allows us to respond to this issue as a public health issue, which then can help us to bring healing messaging and practices into all of our uh, approaches in postvention to include funeral or memorial activities. And so safe and sensitive language is so key when it comes to this issue of suicide, loss, or sudden death. Because the words on the left-hand side, died by suicide, lost to suicide, ended one's life, those are non-judgmental, non-labeling, non-stigmatizing. The words on the right, however, successful suicide and completed suicide, we know what that means, but that implies that it was an accomplishment, something to be aspired to, which is clearly not the case. Committed suicide for lo some loss survivors, people commit sins, people commit crimes. And so they don't see their lost member to suicide having been a criminal or a sinner and chose to kill himself that's problematic as well because if a person's struggling with severe mental illness or substance use issues, then they're clearly not in their right mind. Um, and so was this really a choice? So I would encourage all of today's listeners 
to really treat this as a public health issue, just like with cancer, just like with diabetes. We don't say successful diabetes or committed cancer, suicide death or suicide loss. And for all survivors of suicide loss, you can see on the screen all kinds of emotional reactions all over the map at very, very many different times um, of years of grief and loss. But there's always that universal question of why. And um, that question uh, can really, it can really haunt loss survivors, both young and older, for many, many, many years. And unfortunately, uh, that answer often died with the person who took their life. And that person was just in too much emotional pain to see a way through that pain. Um, so just be mindful of the intensity and the magnitude of grief and loss with any loss survivor, young or older. And then the complexity of grief and loss, as if suicide itself isn't complicated enough, now we add grief and loss, which is incredibly complicated, especially during um, COVID-19 times. And I, I really appreciate what Jen had to say about trauma-informed care approaches, because that's certainly what we want to bring to the table when we're talking about grief and loss after a sudden death to include suicide. Uh, because young and older come to this loss uh, having experienced many other losses in their community or their family, and depending on how that grief is expressed or not expressed, may put them at greater or lesser risk for suicide. Cultural norms and practices are so key when dealing with grief and loss. Typically, we follow the family's lead on this, um, and it may reflect race, ethnicity, and language, but it also may affect religion and spirituality versus a secular approach, or LGBT versus heterosexual, or the military versus civilian, or tribal versus non-tribal. So again, I so appreciate that uh, Jen talked a lot about uh, cultural uh, and, um, and, and disparity. I really appreciate that because in postvention, it is a very key part of grief and loss. And then providing support to any loss survivors. Uh, it is so important for us to know that we do not need to have an answer and we won't have an answer. Um, and sometimes just being present, uh, whether uh, standing at the end of the driveway or being present so the person can see us during these COVID-19 times, um, that is really key. Uh, loss, uh, loss survivor supports are very key. That might be any kind of bereavement group or loss survivor support groups or any of those local or national resources. But the bottom line that we want to really do is respect every person's healing process, young or older. The other thing I will say about COVID-19 is currently there are also many virtual support groups for loss survivors all over the country. So that is a positive because many loss survivors now can attend those groups without travel or uh, childcare um, constraints. And so promoting healing is very key for any of us when we're working with a sudden death to include suicide. We want to make sure that we're connected to uh, the larger community mental health and emergency services, uh, which may include mobile health. Uh, we definitely want to validate and normalize grief and loss reactions. That is so key because any of us who are clinical, uh, clinically based, we know the complications of complicated bereavement. And that happens uh, when people are not able to express their grief and loss because of stigma, because of shame, because just not knowing that territory. So anytime we can validate and normalize all kinds of emotional reactions, uh, that is a really good way to get people into a place of health. We wanna know those warning signs for suicide so we can reach out to those individuals not doing well. And we our, our goal for postvention um, in the months and years to follow oftentimes is restoring that community spirit um, and strength. 
And these are the warning signs that were all covered by Jen, but I just uh, wanted to include them in my presentation as well. And so what we want to do is, uh, as youth serving agencies and schools, uh, we want to reduce that risk for contagion because it impacts the youth and young adults that we serve. Um, this also is a good time to have good networking and interface with those larger community agencies. It's very key because it will keep our safety net strong under people who, are, who might now be at greater risk um, for suicide. And we want to promote safe messaging for all. Um, and this would mean no focus on the specific means used. We do not want to say he shot himself, she hung herself. Suffice it to say, she died by suicide, he was lost to suicide. Um, when um, it we need to take those graphic details out of the death because otherwise we're not able to be sensitive to the needs and the emotions of where lost survivors are at. Uh, many, uh, a year ago when Kate Spade died, the fact that uh, we knew there was a red scarf involved, it was way too much information and it was vicarious trauma. So we really want to treat this as a public health issue, lost to suicide, took their life, died by suicide. And then of course, um, in all things electronic, we really want to uh, post those warning signs, the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, the Crisis Text Line, and also to validate and normalize grief and loss reactions. And so that's anywhere where our youth or young adults might be, certainly in Snapchat, Instagram, and Twitter, but also Facebook and all things electronic communication. And when there's been this type of sudden death, that's when we can explore virtual options, wellness, um, or um, hosted sites for connecting with our youth and young adults in the midst of their grief. And we want to, in, in our schools and youth serving organizations, we want to treat all sudden deaths the same. And so um, we really, in light of the stigma and risk for contagion that exists for suicide, we really do not want those permanent memorials because now it might look like the school or the youth serving agency is actually a, a church or a shrine. Uh, they're honoring this drug overdose death. They're honoring this suicide death uh, with a tree, with a plant, with a, with a park bench. So the bottom line is we really want to treat all sudden deaths the same. And because of the stigma and the shame that accompanies suicide and yet that people can be at greater risk after this type of death, that is the gold bar standard that we would treat all other sudden deaths in our agencies. And as I said, having those protocols in place ahead of time so they can guide our emotions. And so recommended memorial activities um, that for the school, if we understand the in-person protocols that are listed here in terms of providing a time-limited place where those expressions of grief and loss can be put, then we can adapt it creatively for the virtual world. And for COVID-19, any kind of gifting the family with memories um, is going to be much appreciated and very impactful even if we can't attend funeral services in person. So we can get very innovative and heart-centered in terms of the person we have lost in this traumatic manner. So postvention response across all of our agencies and schools really focuses on the indicated level and targeting that inner circle of friends and family who might be most impacted in the minutes and hours and days and weeks after this person's loss to suicide or any other sudden death. And then selective, now we're looking at the larger school community or the larger community beyond that um, and all individuals who might be impacted. So there's your trauma-informed care approach because many individuals in the yellow layer may never have known this person, but they've had similar loss experiences in their own histories.
And then the universal layer might be the social media coverage, uh, which is not um, national best practice, and, and or the media outlets coverage uh, that may either increase risk or re reduce risk after this type of loss. So general postvention guidelines for any of our agencies is confirming the facts is key, and that would be certainly with law enforcement, might be with family. Um, and if the family openly acknowledges it, now they don't want any other family to experience this public health loss. Um, and we want that safe messaging um, and no speaking of means. The principal or their designee should definitely contact um, the family, and that is pre-COVID times or during COVID times, because that issue of connectedness is key, whether virtual or in person. And then certainly contacting with staff in the same manner, um, really working with staff to find out what they need for support, because these individuals, having known this person, they may be the wounded caregivers. So we may refer to an employee assistance program. We want ongoing check-in with our staff. And then conveying the information. This is a lot of information, but basically it indicates that when schools are reaching out to staff and families about this type of loss, and they're doing it in person, for instance, um, with small groups of students early in the day, it's emotional triage. And it allows us to see who is at greater risk moving forward. We do not want to use large assemblies or the PA system um, for any kind of information regarding uh, sudden deaths to include suicide, because that is an over amplification of grief and loss. And then for youth of all ages, we want to really um, stress these things. Um, who do they trust in their life that they can talk to, that they can turn to in a place of healing and moving forward? And really to be gentle with themselves and to know that even if bullying was involved, even if a breakup of a relationship was involved, that person's death was in no shape or form their fault because every person who dies by suicide has some measure of responsibility for their own life. So the research really backs us up that it's a multiplicity of risk factors that leads to this traumatic outcome. And then having the schools or the youth serving agencies, having good um, rapport and working relationships with the local police, with the local mental health center, with local faith leaders and other social service, um, agencies is very key in that crisis assistance moving forward. Self-care skills are key um, and we are coming full circle now uh, for role modeling and the ongoing practices and just like COVID-19 we know that self-care is not about days and weeks. It is about months and often years when we're talking about postvention. And hope for these times choosing hope. This is key. This means when we get out from under this COVID-19 in whatever model we go back to schools, we do not want to um, convey that because we're seeing greater anxiety or depression that we're going to have a tsunami of suicides or an epidemic of suicides. We, we always want to choose hope and convey uh, that we can heal through these losses. And in choosing hope, it might not be a perfect postvention response, but it does make it a human response. And then finally, lots of websites and resources for grief and loss, as well as for suicide loss. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anne and Jen. Uh, I know it's a lot of information. Uh, you know, all at once, and I'm going to try to go ahead and share my screen. So if you yep. stop yep. sharing yours. I sure did. Great. Okay, hopefully just, you know, I, Jen shared some hotlines. I want to make sure people have some hotlines. I saw that people do feel like there's a lot of resources linked in the chat. 
Um, I apologize <laughs> if we're overwhelming you a lot, but certainly the questions are great, and it's just such an important topic. I know to all of you it's challenging, it's overwhelming, and certainly it's a very, you know, it's a topic Jen, Ann, and I think about all the time. And so, you know, we hope that we're able to give you some resources. We hope that you'll be able to go back and look at the webinar after today, check out some of the resources. My contact information uh, is here. You can look at either of these websites. My, my email was at the start. Uh, it's on the first slide or the second slide, jgoldstein at edc.org. Um, certainly people are free to reach out to me. We have a couple of minutes left, and I know a couple of questions that came in. One in particular, and Jen, I'm going to um, punt it to you, was about HIPAA and FERPA and confidentiality with doing screening remotely. I think you may have given a couple of resources and answers in the chat, but I want to I go ahead and highlight that. Thanks, Julie. Um, I think it is best to follow up with the resources, both from uh, FERPA and the uh, Office of Civil Rights and the HIPAA flexibilities, um, they have allowed for communications to be on non-HIPAA compliant platforms. Um, so just want to encourage you about that. And from a trauma-informed uh, principle of perspective, ask the people you are working with, families and students, how they want to be communicated with and have, you can have them agree to a consent or those kind of things to help um, be a part of this. But you can really engage people to say, is it okay if I follow up via text uh, for you? If that's appropriate within your school district, the relationship and that student, um, and ask them what really works best. Great, thanks, Jen. Um, a couple, there were a couple of items in the chat as well, and Anne, I want to give you a chance to kind of elaborate a little bit. The question being about the 90% statistic that 90% of people who die by suicide have a mental health illness, um, but we also know that the CDC a year or two ago said only 46% at the time of their deaths uh, are, have a diagnosis. And you know, what does that mean? Can you kind of contextualize that a little bit? We certainly don't want to. Uh, it, we certainly aren't looking at a sliver of people that have a mental health diagnosis when we think about suicide prevention or even those that, uh, you know, we, we know are, ha are dealing with a mental health issue. I think that ab absolutely, if we focus our resources and our attention there, we are going to miss a lot of people. It's also why for anybody who was able to kind of multitask and follow some of the chat, I was saying we do want to screen everybody at every visit. You always want to ask. I think Jen may have said this, and I can't reiterate it enough. You are not putting the idea in somebody's head by asking them. If you are genuine, showing genuine care and concern that you want to know the answer so that you can help somebody, you are the way of, and being very clear about what you're asking, right? Not, you're not thinking about killing yourself, are you? But rather very clear, you know, sometimes when people are struggling with the things you were just telling me about, it gets so bad they even think about killing themselves. Have you had thoughts like that? Like things that let the person know you are drawing them in, you are there, you want to know their answer, and you have a plan and know what you'll do if they say yes, and you'll check in with them again. Did they do that plan? How did it go? Um, but, but Anne, I want to turn that back over to you to maybe contextualize those kind of different numbers a little bit. Sure. Um, and thank you for the person that um, submitted that. Uh, the point, the 90% the that I cited, anybody could go to nimh.org. That's the National Institute of Mental Health.org. And really, this is none of these issues are cause and effect. We know that to be true. So that any kind of mental health issue, whether diagnosed or not diagnosed, uh, may be, or a substance use issue, diagnosed or not diagnosed, may be a contributing risk factor. And what we know is that certainly with adults, we are much more likely to know that the person may have struggled with mental health issues, whether they sought help or not, whether they recognize that they had mental health issues or not. I think the biggest thing when we're talking about suicide risk and mental health issues and substance use issues is that it's such a shame that there's stigma and shame for all three of these issues. And I would really want to encourage all of us, whether family members 
or as professionals that we start having these discussions openly about mental health as a brain disorder, as a medical condition, just like we would around diabetes or heart disease. Because if I can talk openly about how somebody is feeling, and that's certainly during greater anxiety and depression, perhaps during COVID-19, then I can also open the door to talking about suicide risk. But if I can't have the conversation with them about their feelings, their mental health issues, the things they might be struggling with, then we certainly can't get to the point that they're thinking of dying by suicide. So I really don't want the statistics um, to create yet another barrier. I am just all about uh, creating greater sensitivity to loss survivors of all ages, but also destigmatizing and making help available to anybody with mental health, substance use, or suicide risk. Thanks, Anne. Thank That's you. actually all the time we have left for today. Um, thank you everyone for your questions and to our presenters for their great content. Um, I just launched evaluation poll questions before you log off for today. If you could answer those to just give us some feedback, we'd really appreciate that.